January. Authorities are searching for a suspect who robbed a Subway sandwich shop in Gwinnett County, Georgia, and made sure to come back for his sandwich. The suspect, reportedly identified as 34-year-old Zachary Miller, can be seen on camera ordering a meal before hopping over the counter to steal money from the register. Miller then made a dash for the exit before realizing he left behind his food. Miller remains at large and has several active warrants in Tennessee and Georgia. Those were today's top crime stories. I'm Anthony Velez for Law & Crime. Oh my goodness there, I guess that robber was a bit hungry. I'm joined by Ross Kramer, a criminal defense attorney. Thanks so much for coming today. We have a lot going on, a lot on the docket this afternoon. Uh, that last story, a bit crazy. Where the, the in the subway, where he jumps back <laughs> yes. over and comes back to get a sandwich? Yes. Yeah, that's pretty crazy. All right. So Ross is going to stay with me for the afternoon. We're going to take it back over to the courtroom in South Carolina, uh, where we're continuing to hear testimony inside the Tammy Moore kidnapping trial. Take a listen. All right, we are just listening to testimony from the defendant's sister who's been on the stand for about two and a half hours in this fascinating case out of South Carolina that we've been closely <coughs> monitoring. Tammy Moore, the defendant, facing those conspiracy and kidnapping charges as it relates to the disappearance of a young woman named Heather uh, Elvis. I'm joined now by Ross Kramer, criminal defense attorney. He's been watching this testimony along with me. She's been on the stand for quite some time, and I'm not sure why. She made her point uh, quickly with the defense, uh, defense attorney. She was the first witness. What's going on here? Well, look, if we don't understand why, this jury is not going to understand why. And juries are very likely to turn on lawyers when they feel like their, their time is being wasted. I don't think this is helping anyone. I think, in particular, it's not helping the defense here. They got to the end of the prosecution's case. The lawyers could easily have relied on the fact that it's the burden of proof on the other side. There's a presumption of innocence. We don't have to prove anything. And they put on a witness that doesn't seem to crack the case here. So I'm not really sure that they move forward. And there's a chance you could move backwards. A jury could believe, well, the defendants didn't show me anything, even though as a matter of law, they don't have to show anything. Once they take on the burden of putting up defense witnesses, you know, a, a jurors could get confused about whose responsibility it is here to prove the facts. And again, you know, part of the reason they put her on the stand, I guess, was try, trying to show some kind of alibi for the defendant because uh, she says that she got a text message from Tammy Moore at 3.10 a.m. the night of Heather Elvis's disappearance. And of course, phone records indicate that Heather Elvis was still alive uh, about a half an hour after that because she was trying to call Sydney's phone. So the defense is trying to say, well, listen, if this woman was ki kidnapping Heather Elvis, why was she home and a half hour later, uh, Heather Elvis being able to call a phone? If anything, I think it kind of implicates the husband, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it, I don't think it ties the knot together. First of all, I don't think anybody is going to say that they saw her at home. I think there's just a text message saying she was home. So it's sort of like a half step in the right direction. Direction. But I also think a bigger issue here is you're putting somebody up. Her demeanor, I think, was not exactly what a defense lawyer would want here. She seems to be sort of laughing and taking things lightly and fighting back against the prosecutor. I don't think she's acquitting herself that well. I'm not sure that the defense lawyers uh, did well by calling this witness. All right, and we're seeing some of the uh, cross-examination right now. We've got to take a quick break here on the Law and Crime Trial Network. We'll be back in just a few minutes and take you back live in that case in South Carolina. Stay with us. All right, we're just listening to some more testimony from the defendant's sister. I'm joined by my friend and criminal defense attorney, Ross Kramer, here at the desk with me. We're watching this testimony unfold. What do you make of what the prosecutor is doing so far in this cross-examination? It, it feels unfocused. It feels like she's not following the rules of effective cross-examination, which is you get in, you make your points, you, you get enough facts so that you can tie things together in a closing statement so that you can attack the credibility, and then you move on. This feels like a fishing expedition. It feels like she's asking questions that are pretty unfocused. She's asking questions about a map, the routes that would be taken back and forth in town. 
about text messages about the grandmother's broken down car that are really outside the scope of the value you can get from this witness. So I don't know why she's keeping the witness on the stand this long. Yeah, and I mean, we've got the point of some of the cross-examination. Clearly, uh, Tammy was jealous and upset about uh, what was going on with her husband and Heather Elvis. But like you said, off camera, does that prove that Tammy kidnapped her? Okay, so we're going to have to take a quick break here on the Law and Crime Network, but we're going to take you back inside that courtroom in just minutes. Stay with us. Okay, so this cross-examination just keeps on going and going of the defendant's sister here, Ross Kramer. Yes, it keeps going and going and going. <laughs> and look, you can almost tell that this is an unfocused cross-examination because on cross, when you really are doing it effectively, you know the answers to the questions. You're asking closed questions. Isn't it true that this and that? She's asking her open-ended questions. Tell me why this looks like this in the picture. This is a fishing expedition. I don't know why this is going on all day. All right, we are going to take a quick break here on the Law and Crime Network, but we're going to take you back inside that South Carolina courtroom in just a few minutes, it could get interesting. The defendant is expected to take the stand. Stay with us here on Law and Crime. All right, it looks like we're in a bit of a sidebar in the Tammy Moore case. Uh, we are just listening to some testimony, cross-examination of the defendant's sister. I'm here alongside Ross Kramer, who's been my guest for the afternoon. We've been watching some of this testimony. Finally, 4 o'clock Eastern, we're finally getting to some of the cross-examination regarding those important text messages during the time frame when Heather Elvis disappeared. What did you make of the sisters' response to the questions? Did they help the prosecution at all? I don't think so, and there really wasn't much on the really critical point that the sisters testifying about. You saw about two hours of what seemed like nothing probably putting jurors to sleep at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Then she touched on this alibi, what happened at 3.10 in the morning. And then it, it seems like right before we cut out, she moved off of it to another topic. There was really not much of a focus here on the, the discrete point in time that this witness was, was testifying about. Yeah, and again, we've all been waiting all day, Ross, for that woman you see in your screen right there. Uh, Tammy, the defendant, Tammy Moore in this case, to take the stand. It's been hours and hours of this sister, who I'm afraid is not really that relevant to the case. So far, she's the only defense witness, because I'm sure some of you that have been following the drama of this case know that the defense has been barred from calling their five other witnesses that they had planned to bring to the stand, which raises all sorts of other issues on appeal, potentially, if she's convicted. Yeah, it's, a, it's a pretty amazing ruling. I mean, what it does here is it's sort of a gift to these defense lawyers. It seems like they're far ahead at this point, but what they get now is two bites at an apple. If somehow this defendant is convicted, they have a ready-made issue on appeal, which is that this defendant is entitled to put forth a defense, to call witnesses. These are, these are uh, rights that are guaranteed by the Constitution. If a judge takes that away, that can't be done lightly. This is going to be a major issue on appeal. All right. In the trial world, you really can't have a more fascinating case than the one we're in right now. This is uh, Tammy Moore facing those kidnapping and conspiracy charges for uh, allegedly conspiring with her husband to kidnap her husband's new lover, Heather Elvis, who has disappeared and whose body has never been found. Let's listen to the sister now. More cross-examination by the prosecutor. Are we going to get any relevant info here? Let's listen. Ashley Kaysen still on the stand, the defendant's sister. Uh, this is turning into some very lengthy cross-examination. Right now, they're talking about a substation that was across the street from the Moore's home. And at first, the sister had questioned why the police hadn't checked to prove the sister was home. Um, Tammy Moore was home when she said she was at 3.10 a.m. Um, but then the prosecutor tried to really reverse it on her and say, well, why didn't you check the surveillance video? What do you make of this testimony, Ross Kramer? Well, this is really the danger of putting on a defense case. Under the American <clears throat> system of justice, it's the prosecutor's burden to prove all of these facts. And they put up police officers. They could have been cross-examined. Why didn't you look for this videotape? All of a sudden, when the defendant starts calling their own witnesses and starts putting witnesses on the stand, 
things get turned on their head. All of a sudden, a prosecutor can ask that witness, well, did you look for this tape? Did you ask the police to do it? And it gives the jury the, the misimpression that a defendant in a criminal case has any responsibility to prove their innocence as opposed to the prosecutor having to prove their guilt. Yeah, and it kind of puts the burden on these defense witnesses to do some kind of investigation when clearly there's no responsibility on their part. Okay, we got to take a quick break here on the Law and Crime Network. Stay with us. We'll be back in just a few minutes. Take you back to that courtroom in South Carolina. Carolina. All right, welcome back everybody to the Law and Crime Network. I'm Rachel Stockman. I'm your host for this afternoon. We were inside the Tammy Moore case in South Carolina, but it looks like they finally took a 10 or 15 minute break. And boy, I think the jurors in the case needed that after the defendant's sister on the stand for hours and hours. Uh, I'm not sure uh, if she was dismissed yet or if we're going to hear more from her uh, when we when they come back. But um, I want I want to join, I want to bring in Ross Kramer, criminal defense attorney. He's been with me this afternoon. Uh, what do you make of the testimony we've heard in court so far from this sister in all? I'm not hearing much that's useful <clears throat> really to either side. Um, there was sort of an alibi that she got the text message and sent the kids back over early in the morning. It doesn't tie anything together because she didn't see anybody home. And honestly, the defendant didn't even need to be out and about to be convicted of conspiracy to kidnapping or, or kidnapping at that particular time. But I think, I, I think there was no reason to keep this witness on the stand for this long to put a jury through the, the ordeal of sitting there for a day and trying to parse this testimony out for anything useful. Uh, it seems like this trial is waiting for something to happen, whether that's the defendant testifying or whether it's the defense resting and moving on to closing statements, it feels like this is a prelude to something rather than an event in itself. Yeah, and it is curious to see if we had been able to hear from the other five defense witnesses if we'd have a different view on how the defense's case is going so far. But I think all in all, I don't know how much this particular witness helped the defense. No, I agree with you. I, I, I don't think that uh, the defense made much headway. But then again, you know, the, the, the real wisdom in one of these cases is you don't even put on a defense case if you're ahead. If after the prosecution rests, you don't believe you're going to be convicted. So you didn't need to move forward. It's, it's sort of curious why the defense was putting on any witnesses at all here. Um, it feels like something where promises were made at, op you know, at opening, opening statements, statements and maybe there wasn't enough forethought to realize they wouldn't even need to put this on. The, the, the burden that's on the prosecution and the presumption of innocence may be enough to carry the day and they're, you know, they're taking half steps backwards here when they don't need to. All right. Well, it's going to be very interesting uh, to see what happens in this case. They're in a brief break, 10 minutes. Will Tammy Moore, the defendant in this case, take the stand? If she does, we'll stream it here live on the Law and Crime Network. You will not want to miss that, so stay with us. In the meantime, we have some breaking news in another case that we've been covering, and that is the Shana Huber's case out of Kentucky. She was the young woman convicted of killing her attorney boyfriend. She claimed self-defense. Just moments ago, we have learned that she was sentenced to life in prison. We'll continue to monitor that case and we'll have a, uh, more about it on our website as well, lawandcrime.com. But for now, let's take a look at some of the other stories trending across America. Here are today's top crime stories trending on lawandcrime.com and across the country. Dennis Hoff, the owner of several legal brothels in Las Vegas and a would-be politician, died at one of his brothels following a campaign rally. According to authorities, the 72-year-old author of Art of the Pimp was reportedly found dead at his Love Ranch Vegas bordello with no apparent signs of foul play. Hoff shocked pundits when he mounted a Donald Trump-style campaign and unseated a Republican incumbent in a Nevada state primary during the summer. Hoff's name will remain on the ballot, and if he pulls off a posthumous win, the seat will be considered vacant. A man accused of mailing envelopes containing white powder and threatening messages to Donald Trump's sons and a U.S. senator pleaded guilty in federal court in Boston. 25-year-old Daniel Friasello allegedly sent the letters to both Eric and Donald Trump Jr. with the suspicious white powder which turned out to be cornstarch. Trump Jr.'s estranged wife, Vanessa, was briefly hospitalized after opening one of the letters but was later released. Friasello will be sentenced in January. 
Authorities are searching for a suspect who robbed a Subway sandwich shop in Gwinnett County, Georgia, and made sure to come back for his sandwich. The suspect, reportedly identified as 34-year-old Zachary Miller, can be seen on camera ordering a meal before hopping over the counter to steal money from the register. Miller then made a dash for the exit before realizing he left behind his food. Miller remains at large and has several active warrants in Tennessee and Georgia. Those were today's top crime stories. I'm Anthony Velez for Law Enforcement. Okay, so Tammy's sister is now commenting on a picture of the bed where Tammy and Sydney slept in and basically telling the jurors that there's really nowhere you could latch handcuffs on, trying to poke holes at the prosecution's theory or story or accusation that Tammy punished her husband by, by tying him up at night. I'm serious. This is a real case that we're following here, Ross Kramer. Yeah, the problem is that this is a kidnapping case. This yes. isn't. This isn't a case about adultery. And the prosecutor is doing a great job in proving that there was an affair here. They're, they're doing a great job in proving that this was a very messy situation. That these two, that this couple was really at odds at the end when this affair was discovered, and that this was a really horrible home life. They're not proving that this was a kidnapping. They're not taking it that one step. And it's clear why they're doing it. They're trying to show that there was a motive here. Well, and they're trying to show that she was really the mastermind in all of this and that it was, you know, that she had control of him and that she, she was uh, trying to exact punishment and she was upset about this. Um, but, you know, like you said, does that prove a crime occurred? Well, jur jurors are smart. Uh, at the end of the day, any lawyer who doesn't give jurors enough credit for that is going to lose a trial. And I think that the prosecutors here may be losing sight of the fact that these jurors are not going to be tricked into thinking just because there was an affair, just because there was a motive for something to happen, they have to prove more. They have to tie it all together and show that at the end of the day, there was a conspiracy to commit a kidnapping or an actual kidnapping here. They can't go three of the four steps and then end it and expect to get a conviction in this case. Yeah, we'll see what happens because we were going over some of the evidence in this case. Not a whole lot of hard evidence. You have a lot of circumstantial evidence. Will the jurors weave together a picture to convict Tammy Moore? That is the question. She's expected to take the stand. Could come now, could come tomorrow, could come any minute now. Stay with us here on the Law and Crime Network as we take a quick break. All right, we are back here on the Law and Crime Network, and we've got a fascinating trial that we're covering in South Carolina. If we take a live shot, you can see it looks like folks are gathering back in the courtroom, and court will begin any minute. It looks like it's going to be redirect of this sister, uh, the defendant's sister, who we've seen on the stand all day long. I'm joined by my guest, Ross Kramer. He's been with me as we've been listening to some of this testimony. Um, what do you think the uh, uh, defense attorney is going to try to achieve in this redirect? I mean, if he's, if he's paying attention here, I think he'll try to bring it back to what this testimony actually means to the case. And he'll focus it and say, you know, the, the impression will be, you, the jury has heard from you for four hours, but this is really what it's about. You got this text message late at night. It said that your sister was home and you reacted to it. You sent the kids back. And that's really what the value of this witness is. Hopefully, it's late in the day. This jury will still have enough energy to pay attention and catch what the gist of this testimony was and sweep under the rug all of the extraneous testimony that just happened around this witness. And I don't think we're going to see uh, Tammy Moore take the stand. I mean, it's already 438 in the afternoon. Uh, we were expecting maybe she would, but I think it's just getting too late in the day. But you know what? There's always surprises, and that's why we love live court. Let's take it back to South Carolina. All right, it looks like a little sidebar going on. What do you make, though, you know, the defense attorney has his only witness, really, for the day on the stand, and he's going over some of this tattoo information. It had previously been alleged that Tammy got a tattoo, excuse me, Sydney got a tattoo of Tammy's name after the abduction and maybe this was suspicious or something like why would they do that but uh, that aside does this really matter as it goes towards the nature of this case and the crime yeah i'm surprised that the defense lawyer is spending so much time asking questions about it because it kind of gives it credibility it makes it seem like he agrees that this is somehow important if i was a defense lawyer 
I would be focusing in my closing and, and stacking up right now for my closing saying, nobody saw a man commit a kidnapping with this tattoo. This is just not important. Here's the forensic evidence that would be important. We don't have fingerprints. We don't have blood. And that's we don't the have tattoo, DNA. by the way, you're seeing on the side of your screen um, of a witness holding up the picture there. It's a bit hard to see, but that's it. Sorry, keep going, Russ. Yeah, I was just saying, you know, that, that that tattoo is just not important here to guilt or innocence. And if I was the defense lawyer, I'd be, instead of asking these questions, I'd be sort of pushing this aside and getting ready to say, they don't have the evidence that matters. We're not looking for a picture of a tattoo. We're looking for anything that's indicia of a kidnapping here. We don't have fibers from a rope. We don't have any kind of evidence from the trunk of a car. We don't have any evidence from the front seat of a car. We don't have hair. We don't have fibers. In 2018, this is the kind of thing that a jury wants to see. These are jurors that are raised on CSI and SVU, and they want to see blood evidence, and they want to see DNA evidence. Unless you're going to believe, I would argue as a defense lawyer, unless you're going to believe that these are some master experienced kidnappers who could uh, undertake this crime without leaving a shred of evidence, you can't convict here. But this defense lawyer is focusing on almost what the prosecution wants to focus on. Yeah, it, it, it's really interesting because if you drill down to the actual evidence in this case, there really is not a lot of evidence. You have cell phone pings, you have uh, text messages, you have phone calls, you have some surveillance video, not exactly at the scene of where she's thought to have disappeared, but you don't have those forensics. Where's the hair follicles? Where, you know, that so much of these juries want to hear? Okay, let's continue to listen. From what I understand, um, the jury was asked to leave, and this is a matter now being discussed among the attorneys. Let's listen. Okay, so the judge sent the jurors out of the room, and right now the defense attorneys are arguing about this Facebook photo that was posted in January 2012 that the witness posted, and it was showing Cindy getting a tattoo, that tattoo that had Tammy's name on it. Now, why is this controversial? Because in their uh, case in chief, the state had said that Sydney got the tattoo in 2013. Does that matter, Ross Kramer? I don't think it matters to the ultimate issues in this case. I think the prosecution is making the most out of the evidence that they have, and if they're focusing on this tattoo, I think that's because they admitted in their opening statement, we don't know what happened when these people met on the night of the disappearance, and they don't have the but goods. That's a big discrepancy. If the, the state is trying to say, the prosecutors are trying to say, hey, she got, isn't this suspicious? He got this tattoo professing his love to his wife right after the murder? Or, excuse me, we don't know if she was murdered. Right after the disappearance? And then it turns out that was not even true? That kind of, uh, in terms of credibility of the prosecution's case, I would say that definitely pokes some holes. Yeah, I, th I think it definitely pokes holes. Whenever somebody gets a fact wrong like that, a judge gives a very important instruction to the jury, and he says, if you believe that a witness lied or was mistaken, you can choose to either disregard only that portion of the testimony, or you can disregard the entire testimony if you think that a certain witness was being untruthful. I mean, this is very powerful, that one of the best things a defense lawyer can do is to try to catch a witness in a misstatement or a lie. Well, very interesting. Okay, Ross Kramer, I know you're staying around for the Daily Debrief. I'm signing off. If you want to continue to listen to testimony, head to our website. Otherwise, stick around for the Daily Debrief.